Hey everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue, and I'm with Brian Caffarelli today. Brian is one of the people I cite in the back of the snowball system as being one of the top 50 people that was most influential in my career. And he's just one of the best, not even just business developers, but just one of the best value creators, one of the best relationship builders, one of the best trust builders, one of the best human beings that uh, I've ever met in my entire life. And it's a thrill to have him on the show. In this particular episode, I asked Brian, like, what, what's the moment that he realized that, that business development is something he wants to focus on? That growth is great. I didn't know he'd take me to the cornfields of Iowa when I asked that question, but he goes all the way back to the genesis of his thoughts around these things. And it's a super interesting story, lots to learn from. So that's coming up in a second. Know that if you want to have our latest thought piece, which is called High Impact Relationship Deepeners, it's the top seven ways that you can deepen relationships each in five minutes or less. All you have to do to get it is head over to growbigplaybook.com. That's growbigplaybook.com. You can sign up. You'll get it in a few seconds. It's awesome. All right. So here is one of the most special people I've ever met, Brian Caffarelli. Hey everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Super excited because I've got a treat for you today. Brian Caffarelli's here. This is one of, the, Brian, you are one of the people that uh, I look up to as some of my, it, the, the top people ever that influenced me. So I'm really excited to have you on the show. Everybody, uh, as you know, Brian and I were both at Hewitt Associates back in the day. And some of my uh, some of my memories of working with clients and having the most fun and having the deepest impact, Brian, are with you. So thank you so much for being on the show. Oh well, a Mo, it's very kind of you, and B, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm I'm honored to be with you today. So thank you very much. You got it. You got it. And for uh, and for everybody to to know, when I wrote the snowball system. When I did the acknowledgments back in the back, I, I picked the top 50 people in my whole life, including my mom and dad, that were the most influential to me. Brian, you're in there. So I thought that was uh, that was fun. Well, Brian, tell me this, you know, um, question one at the beginning of each of the first episodes with guests this year, they're all the same. The, the audience mostly knows what that is. But if they're dropping in for the first time, tell me of the moment when you realized that business development was something you wanted to focus on, that growth is great, that for whatever reason, this is something that you want to sort of lean into, work on and focus on. Give it to me. Yeah, you know, Mo, it actually probably goes back to my first job out of college. I was working for Ford Motor Company and um, the entry level position, entry level sales position at Ford Motor Company was a wholesaler. So I was responsible for selling cars to dealers. I sold the Ford, product, Ford production to the dealers, the dealers sold it to their customers. And when I started out, my territory was the Eastern half of Iowa. And uh, I spent four days and four nights a week hanging out with automobile dealers in the Eastern half of Iowa. And you know what I learned contrary to some popular stereotypes is that these dealers were excellent businessmen. And in many cases, you know, they were running second generation, third generation, fourth generation family businesses. They'd survived the Great Depression, World War II, gas crisis, uh, the invasion of the imports, the ups and downs of the Ford brand. And, you know, because I was primarily in um, an agricultural environment, you know, they dealt with all of the cycles that impacted the farmers. And, you know, the interesting thing that I learned is like in the car business, people say, well, I'm a Ford guy or I'm a Chevy guy or I only buy Lexus. Or if you watch the Christmas story, uh, Ralphie's dad was an Oldsmobile man. But nobody starts out that way. And it certainly wasn't the case here. You know, it all begins or it all began at some point in time with the salesperson who was sincere and caring and who understood and who mastered their product, taking the time to form a deep relationship with the customer. And that's where the first sale happened. You know, and then you could sort of go on into history and one sale begat another, begat another, and all of a sudden I'm a Ford person 
then it's I'm a Ford family, then it's my grandfather was a Ford person and that's why I'm a Ford person. But it all started with the seller who cared creating an initial relationship with the potential customer. And, you know, I thought this is a noble and fulfilling role. And it's one I'd like to study to understand how people excel in that role. And it's one maybe hopefully that someday I could excel in. So that's the backstory, really. Yeah. So you're, 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 I can imagine you're driving around probably in a Ford, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. yeah. And you're calling on folks and you're, I would guess there's some lunches and breakfast and dinners and watching them do their magic while you're talking to somebody else and all those things. So then, so then when was there a spark that said this, is, I love your words, noble and fulfilling. What, what was your, what did you then do yourself to start to figure out how do you do this? How do you do it the right way? How do you have a sincere and caring relationship? How do you master the product? How do you have this deep, longer term relationship? How did you start to decode things and get great at your great at it yourself? Well, I'm not sure I ever got great at it, but I can share how I started to decode things. You know, there were there were outstanding. First off, it was just hanging around and watching. I mean, that's first and foremost, hanging around and watching. Then there were salespeople that were just year over year over year, really, really successful and really well respected. And, you know, I was just a kid and and they were kind and um, caring and they were interested that I was interested. And I, I just would continue to ask them, ask them, what do you do? How do you do it? What are you thinking? And then the other thing, just because I was the represent, representative of the factory, I got to speak to a lot of customers. And, you know, I heard from the customers what they liked, what resonated with them, why they bought. And sometimes it was the car, but a lot of times it was the person or the dealership. And um, so that's sort of where I began to began to learn. Yeah. So let's let's go deeper. You know, you you teach a lot of classes yourself. You have this thriving practice where you're helping other people learn these kind of skills. What's your advice to somebody that that's already good and wants to get better, or somebody that uh, man, I I really love this idea of noble and fulfilling as a as a, as a focus for business development. What do you say to the person that maybe they've they've been successful now, but they want to rise even more? What should they do? Well, first I say, read the snowball system. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent idea. <laughs> um, uh, but, you, you know, then I, I think, Mo, maybe maybe two things here. Uh, one is there's an aspect, I think there is an aspect or element of fundamentals. I think you'd, you'd agree with that. Yep. And, yep. you know, I, I think, you know, those people that want to get better, sometimes you lose track of or sometimes you're not current with fundamentals and here fundamentals around psychology, communication, et cetera, et cetera. So I think yeah. continue to study and try to master the fundamentals. So that that's one. But then second, you know, apply them, you know, apply, you know, once you've sort of learned about it, be open minded, learn something new and apply it. And there. You know, I think a, a, a term a lot of people use is intentional practice, but just like do it, do it, do it, A. And then B is constantly reflect. Like, what did I do well? What didn't I do well? What did I do well? What didn't I do well? And Mo, there, I, I think I'll defer to you on this, but I would imagine when you're coaching the people that you work with, you're sort of holding up a mirror to them and helping them reflect on what they did well, what they didn't do well, what really happened in that situation so they can deconstruct. So not, not only can they revel in a win perhaps, but deconstruct what led up to the win so that they can be better and better. And then maybe third thing on this is that reflection helps you with pattern recognition. And I think sometimes business development has a lot to do with being astute at recognizing patterns. And so maybe those three things play into yeah, it. Yeah, I like all those. Um, and pro tip for everybody, and you know this, Brian, but there's a 100-point self-assessment in the Snowball system right at the front of the book. And it's a downloadable tool you can get through the link that's in the book. 
incredibly powerful. I go through that once a year because no matter where I'm at, it shows me, oh yeah, I forgot about that fundamental or this fundamental I've lost track of. And I loved your words around that. And then of course, applying and reflecting. Well, Brian, let's close out this episode with this um, because I, I doubt you've shared this with anybody. What, what are you, what are you personally working on improving? You know, cause you're, you are a master at this. You are the black belt pro ninja. I know you're, you know, you don't say those kind of things. I can say it, but you are among the best of the best. We're all striving to get better. What's your next thing? Uh, well, I, I'll probably, well, I can, I could list a bunch, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with, I feel like I need to be a lot keener and better as it relates to observation, observing and listening in a virtual environment. So, so that's number one. Um, number two is, uh, Mo, I'm, I'm starting to become an old old dog. And so there's a positive to pattern recognition and there's a negative to pattern recognition. And sometimes, you know, I think I recognize a pattern when it's not really there. I need to be more open to the fact that I'm seeing something different. And, you know, the third thing is to try to keep learning new things, especially as it relates to psychology, communication, influence, persuasion, etc. Because I think there are groundbreaking studies being done all the time, especially as we're able to peer into a little bit how our brains work. And um, yeah, I just don't want to lean back on old ways just because they worked once. So, yeah. um, so three things that, that I try to work on. Well, one, one thing I, I like, I like all those. And one of the things I want to say to the audience is a study came out just a couple of years ago, just to, to build on what you just said about new things are coming out all the time. And I want to point out, Brian, something you said that everybody can learn from even more broadly than the three things. In the study, um, I think the researcher was named Dr. Victor Atati, and he coined a term, a mental heuristic he named called earned dogmatism. And it basically says, the more you become an expert in a thing, the more closed-minded you become. So Brian, the reason you're so good, I'm saying this to the whole audience here, is because you have fought against earned dogmatism your whole life. I remember being in conference rooms back in 1998 or whenever it was, maybe a little after, around then, and you, you were talking about learning then. And you were already known as being among the best of the best. So here we are 20 years later plus, and you're still fighting against certain dogmatism. And I think it's the people who do that that keep climbing. And it's the hardest thing in the world to resist. Anyway, give, give, me, give me your quick thoughts on that. And then we'll wrap this episode up. Uh, I, Mo, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And, and you, know, you know, I know you have such an incredible practice working with people in the professional services realm that are experts in their own right. Right. And I do think, you know, to that point, there's something earned dogmatism. I've also heard the term sometimes used the expert paradox. The more you know, the less you will know. And um, and I think guarding against that is is really, really important. Sage words of wisdom from Brian Caffarelli, everybody. So, hey, uh, Brian, people are going to want to connect with you, say thank you for your insights or reconnect with you from the old days or whatever. Where should they go? Uh, two easy ways. One is uh, Brian Caffer Caffarelli at stsconsulting.com or um, I I'm on LinkedIn and, and that's an easy way to get me too. Cool. Well, everybody, we'll put those in the show notes so you can just click on a link and, and get it. Everybody, don't forget, subscribe, follow, set up those notifications. We got four more awesome episodes coming up with Brian next and you're going to want to hear, you're going to know when they drop. So Brian, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Mo. Hey, everybody. Mo Bunnell, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Had an absolute blast with Brian Caffarelli, who's with me again today in our last episode. And we really, if you haven't, if, you, if you're dropping on this one, make sure that you go back and check that last one, especially near the end where we cover some really meaty topics of basically the number one thing you want to avoid and then the flip side of that is do to really keep getting great at business development. So in this episode, Brian, this is actually really interesting because I've known you for a long time. Uh, I view you as one of the best I've ever met in 
gosh, working with tens of literally tens of thousands of people, both in corporate lives. And then especially since since launch, launching Bundle Idea Group, you are, in my opinion, one of the best of the best ever. I've never asked you this before. What is your personal definition of business development? Um, there's a definition I, I really like, Mo, uh, and it's this. It's the um, art and science of guiding the buyer through their journey to an informed and competent decision. I mean, Ooh, say, that, that was a lot. Say it again. Say it again. So the art and the science yep. of guiding the buyer through their journey to an informed and confident decision. Ooh, there's a lot to unpack. De decode it for me. Um, okay, so uh, I'll start with this. I, I, actually, Mo, I'll let you decode the first part. I do think business development is art and science. Yep. Everybody that's good at it understands the science, but just understanding the science doesn't make you an artist. There are people yeah. that have the ability to be an artist, but without understanding the science, their art might not be sustainable. So I think it starts with art and science. Yep. I, would you... What what are your thoughts on that? Well, I well, I love that, and I think the the art to to just get really practical with for the audience, the art is being able to be fluid in the moment. It's being able to try new things. It's being able to test, um, to stretch outside your comfort zone, to have empathy for the other side, and tweak something in the moment because you're sensing they're not fully engaged or they are or whatever. The science is man with business development. There's so much science around. Why, why does somebody like somebody else? So hundreds of studies around that, being able to decode it. Why does somebody say yes to one opportunity and not another? You know, there's science behind that. Gosh, turning it on ourselves. How do we hack our own habits to succeed? Science behind that. And, and so there's so much, there's so much to both of those. And you're right. One without the other, you can end up astray a little bit. Your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Couldn't agree more. Cool. Well, let's let's go um, in, in, in. I think the takeaway for the audience on that one is you, you don't want to just do one of the two. You don't want to just take great rainmakers to lunch and art, you know, have them talk about metaphors and stories, the arty side. You don't want to only dig into peer reviewed research. Really blending the two is a, is is fantastic. So go deeper on, I really like the next couple words, guiding the buyer. We won't even get to the through their journey yard, but, but there's a guide. Just the act of being a steward, a guide is interesting. Please, more. Yeah. Uh, so th this metaphor, this metaphor is kind of personally meaningful to me. I, I am, Mo, I am not a mountain climber, but I have climbed a couple of mountains. And, you know, I think back to those experiences in each one of those experiences, there was a guide. There was a guide that's been on the mountain before. There was a guide that has summited before. There was a guide that understood everything that it took and how to break up the days in order to get those folks that he was guiding to their ultimate destination, to their particular summit. And, you know, I think those guides are especially smart at understanding what each of the climbers wanted from that experience, whether for some it was just sort of the personal, it was something personal about summiting. For others, it was understanding the geology or the flora and the fauna or challenging themselves. And so those guides were able to make each of the individuals that they were guiding actually realize their own experience and get to the summit and get to the summit safely. Whereas the climbers, hadn't been there before, hadn't done it, been a little, are a little bit nervous, maybe uh, overestimate their capabilities, maybe underestimate their capabilities, maybe not know how to deal with certain situations, but the guides were there to help them get everything they wanted out of that experience. And I always think about a little bit about on those tracks, as we go through the tracks, the guides in the front, the climbers are behind the guide. And so I think, you know, in many cases, in many cases, our buyers are the climbers. They've never been on the mountain before. And the really good sellers are the guides, helping the buyer get what they need to experience from the mountain and ultimately achieving their own personal summit. Yeah, I really like that metaphor. And there's so much to unpack even with that. You know, a guide isn't pushy. A guide isn't dragging somebody. 
a guide isn't um, telling you exactly what you should do without your input. You know, so when you think about just 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 go deeper, just sing with singularity, like on the word guide um, in, in apply it to business development. What are really, you know, go deeper than the metaphor and get to practicality. Yeah. What what should a great guide be doing and what should they not be doing specifically around business development? Well, a couple of things there. I, I, I think first off, I, I do think and push back on this. You've probably been on a number of vacations or experiences where you, you used a guide. So you have your own personal experiences here. But I think a defining characteristic of a guide is the ability to inspire trust. And so first and foremost, you know, inspire trust. I always think trust comes before the sale. Sometimes people thinking think about selling motions, but trust comes before the sale. So it's trust building motions first. Yep. First and foremost. So inspire trust. That's number one. Number two is we should be able to see around the corners for our buyers. We should be able to see around the corners because we've been there before. You know, I know that you're thinking I know that you're thinking this, and this is great, and this is fantastic, and we should think this, but we have to think this first, th and we have to think this first, and then this next. Yep. It will help them think better. And then, you know, I, I also think help keep them safe. Yep. You know, I mean, you need to be vulnerable when you make a buying decision. You could make a bad decision. You know, help keep them safe as it relates to the decision. That might mean you know, gently challenging their thinking, point out potentially a blind spot, um, um, use your what ifs, this could happen, what do you think here? Yeah. Uh, so act that way as or act that way within the course of the conversation. You know, I think a lot of people, I do like the metaphor, I don't want to overplay it, but I think a lot of people have been on a vacation before where they might have gone somewhere unfamiliar or done something unfamiliar and there was a guide there and the guide made that vacation fantastic they made it memorable they made it fantastic they brought more to that than the person would have had on their own and i think that's the responsibility of a good seller yeah you reminded me of a, a story brian we um uh, maybe eight or ten times we've gone out to a dude ranch and we take the whole family and 10,000 plus acres adjacent to tens of thousands of others that are public land. I mean, when you, you can ride for a day or two in one direction and still be on the ranch or the adjacent public property. And you, you, I was thinking, as you were talking, I was thinking, man, when, when has a guide guided me or my family, right? And I think back to last summer and my daughter and other daughter and wife, and we're like, we're all, all four of us, you know, have gone there dozens or dozen times or whatever. And, uh, I, there's a young lady, she's in college and she's the, she's the uh, wrangler and she's guiding us through it. And of course you want to ride fast, right? You're, you're on the dude ranch, you want to go, but she took it steady. She, and we're all pretty experienced. The, the women in my life are much more experienced riders than I am, but we, we took it steady and we were able to culminate in like just this beautiful gallop across the full on across the field. We had a wonderful time. Then I thought, as you were talking about, Oh man. And I had like this flashback experience from a time when there was a Wrangler and he was guiding more for himself than us. And he kept saying, let's bushwhack our way back. <laughs> and he had my wife who like rides in 100 mile horse races. Like she teaches riding to people. And she, he had her jumping across some big ravine that there was no reason to do it. And, and that ended up hurting the horse and a bunch of other stuff. But it was because not because Becky wasn't experienced. It was because the guide was doing the wrong things. He was thinking more about himself than he was who he was taking care of. So but back to the, I love the metaphor. Let's double down on it. Back to business development. Sometimes people can run into trouble when they're thinking more about their own pocketbook or their own goals or whatever versus the people they're guiding. Your thoughts? Oh, I, Mo, I think that's the last part of the, I think that's right on target. And I think that's the last part of the definition. What we're guiding the buyer to is their informed and confident decision. You know, and, and I think sometimes that's hard and, you know, you really have to trust and respect the firm that you're representing. Yeah. But I think as a seller, if your perspective is, my job is to help the buyer 
make an informed and competent decision. If that's my focus, the buyer make an informed and competent decision, then you know, I have to have faith that will end up in the right place. I mean, you mentioned earlier on that you and I worked together at Hewitt Associates. I don't think any buyer I ever encountered started their journey saying, my destination is Hewitt. I wish they would have, but that was never their destination. Their destination at the beginning of their journey was an informed and confident buying decision. And so it was incumbent, I feel it was incumbent upon us to respect that and help them make an informed and confident decision. That's their journey with faith that an informed and confident decision would ultimately mean good things for us. But we gotta start with informed and confident decisions. Well, I like every bit of the definition, the art and science part, the guide part, that this is their journey to, to make the best decision for them part at the end. Everything about it's great. What, Brian, what would be your personal advice if, if somebody's hearing this, it's really striking a chord with them. Maybe they, they haven't thought of things in this way. Potentially, they're just starting out on their, their own business development journey themselves. What would be your advice to put this into action? You know, I think uh, um, m maybe, Mo, uh, two things uh, or two things that can help ground it. You know, the first would be to, to be a guide. You have to earn and inspire trust. So to, to work on the skills and the behaviors and the motivations that help you inspire the trust of those people that ultimately you'd like to guide. I think that's number one. Mm -hmm. I think number two is to study and learn from buyers, you know, and, and I know you do this. And this is one of the things I love about the way that you approach this topic is that, you know, it's great that we study how to sell, but we also have to study how people buy, how people buy and how the psychology around how psychology plays out in how people make buying decisions. We have to understand that. And so, you know, always sharpen and work on the skills and behaviors associated with selling, but really study how people buy, because in the end, that's, that's what we're trying to help people do. That's exactly right. And I, I just have to, I have to grab this from the side, Brian. We're still alive. It's okay. I know I disappeared for a moment, but you just made me think like even the tagline we've got for Grow Big is, we get it in the frame, designing a better buying process. Man, it's, it's yeah. not about... Success is not about selling something. It's about creating a magnetic, attractive, enjoyable buying experience where the person loves it so much they run around and tell their friends about it. Like I love, I still remember, you know, flying on planes and meeting you in cities and and, and working together to, to design a great buying experience for, for a client of Hewitt. And, you know, more than our share kept coming back to us because we actually tried really hard not to be pushy, to not think about our, you know, of course, to some extent you think about yourself, but to how do you design that great buying experience? And you're one of the masters. So Brian, people are going to want to, um, to, to say thanks to you, to, to connect with you in some ways, where should they go? Um, two ways to get two two easy ways. One is uh, Brian dot at STS consulting.com or I, I'm just on LinkedIn. So um, any LinkedIn is great too. Perfect. Well, we'll put those down in the show notes, everybody. So it's easy, just one click and you connect with Brian. I can't recommend him highly enough. And let's, um, uh, and, and let's remember everybody follow, subscribe, set up those notifications, all that stuff for the show. Cause we get three more awesome episodes with Brian coming your way. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Mo. Take care. Hey everybody, Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. This is the third of five episodes with Brian Caffarelli, somebody that I look up to as being really, really amazing at inspiring trust, at designing a great buying experience, and somebody who taught me a lot uh, over the years. So, Brian, the, the, the beginning question of this episode is, what's your favorite science step or story in the snowball system? Um, you know, Mo, there's... There's so much in there. Can I have two? 
You can have two. You okay. can have two. You're you're in the acknowledgments, so you're like okay. you're in the acts as somebody that that uh, that I look up to. So you can have as many as you want. Okay, so I'll pick two: one very specific and one that's more thematic. Okay, got it. Uh, so for for me, I think the very specific one is the concept of whole brain thinking. Yep. And uh, the Herman brain dominance instrument. Yep. And I think that from a scientific perspective. That's the specific one that really strikes me. Good. We'll go deeper. Like when when you apply it, when you think about it, when um, uh, when you utilize it, what what? How do you do it? Let us peek inside the brain of Brian Caprielli to see how are you using it in in what you do. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll, so how about this? I'll just start with you know the simple communication model of sender message receiver. And, you know, I know I fall prey to this all the time in that I might over index on the message when I'm trying to communicate effectively, I'll tend to over index on the message and I under index on the receiver, on the individual that's going to receive the message and the frameworks and the constructs and the way they perceive the message. And, you know, no matter what the message is, it's going to fall flat unless you have a vocabulary and a framework for analyzing the way the individual prefers to and most effectively receives that message. And I think what you've outlined in whole brain thinking and the way you use the Herman brain dominance instrument, I think that's just... Uh, it's just perfect. It's a perfect way to begin to deconstruct the preferences of the receiver such that we ultimately create a message that will resonate with them. Yeah, I, I love it. And everybody, if you're curious about this, go back in the Real Relationships, Real Revenue archives, find the series of five interviews I did with Kareem Hermanetti. He's CEO of Herman International. And man, we decode the whole brain thinking every which way to Sunday, tons of value in that. One thing, Brian, that I think is interesting about you is even if I go back to the, like the late 90s, early 2000s, when we, we were working together a lot, I can remember having airport dinner conversations and uh, little breakfast conversations at the office before the day started, getting started early, things like that. And you were always laser focused much more on the question than, than us talking about what we were going to say. And I, you know, here we are 20 some years later, and it is still a light bulb moment for people in our, in our trainings when we say prepare more about what you're going to ask and discuss in general, thematically, you know, start, in other words, prepare your great questions as opposed to preparing what ends up, what end up can being a lot of times, you know, the 72 page PowerPoint and people rehearsing the things they're going to say versus how they're gonna ask. You've always been more oriented around the question, this idea of the, the receiver being important. Um, so before we go back to your, your second favorite thing, the thematic thing, you do such a darn good job of listening. How do you keep, in, in focusing on the receiver, how do you keep that front of mind in your mind in a meeting? You know, um, uh, Mo, just sort of a, a I don't know, maybe it just has happened over time, but a couple of things that I, I, I think about. One, I I really do believe this. Maybe this is going to come across as Pollyanna, but I really do believe this. I really do believe that most often the buyers, the buyers that I've been fortunate enough to work with, you know, and, and Mo, you've probably seen this too when you were a consultant, the, with the consulting work that you did, the people across from you could solve their own problems. They just needed the space to think out loud uh, and to hear themselves think. And I do think good questions are the prompting to help people think out loud and to hear themselves think and to ultimately come to grips with whatever problem they're trying to solve and make the best decision for them. And, you know, I feel like that a little bit is sort of our responsibility, either as a consultant or as a seller to give people the space and the opportunity to think out loud. So, so that's number one. Yep. Um, no, number two, I, I've, I've seen you do this exercise. Uh, it resonates with me. I, may, I think about this all the time, 
is um, when I write down exactly, when I write down when somebody says something and I write that down exactly, how many words in a particular sentence are just left open to interpretation. And if you don't take the time to uh, better understand those words, you'll be lost. You know, I, I, I feel like, um, I, I feel like I saw you do this, Mo. I'm, I'm like positive I saw you do this. So, so uh, react to this. This is back in the day when we were working together where there was a client, you might even remember who the client was. They happened to be in Nashville. And uh, they said words to the fact that we need a new wellness program. And, you know, if you write that statement down, we need a new wellness program. And you just think about it. I don't understand who we is. I don't understand what need means. Uh, I clearly don't understand wellness program. That's way open to interpretation. And I really don't understand new. I mean, is new, we need one or we need to replace one? And like, if you just gloss over that simple statement, the fact of the matter is you probably don't understand we need new or wellness program. And I think it's just good to train to sort of think about how many words are left open to interpretation. And if we don't understand them, maybe the person who said it doesn't quite understand it yet. And so let's just ask. So I don't know. You, you, I don't know if you remember that moment, but it struck, made an impression on me. So I, I don't remember that exact moment, but I actually had something in my mind from that, from that same client that I'm going to bring up later. Cause it was a, it was a time when you did something absolutely brilliantly, but, but we'll get to that later. What's interesting about what you just said, and it ties back to whole brain thinking is in that simple sentence, we also don't understand why did they think that? Is it, are they looking at analytics? Is there a procedural breakdown of something that already exists? Are they worried with empathy about their employees? Is there something strategically going on? Well, I just hit the four ways of thinking and there could be an underlying issue that's all of those four, two of them, one of them, whatever. So you're right, like just that one sentence, and this is, I'm trying to use specific numbers for the audience. Man, we could probably ask questions for 45 minutes and still not totally understand the situation. But by doing so, we're focused on the receiver. We're figuring out exactly how we might be able to help. Maybe it involved us at Hewitt in the day or somebody else. But I saw you do this so brilliantly over time is unpack, figure out what's really going on, and then like have some kind of tangible next step to be the guide and take them on their journey. Everybody, if you like those words, go back and listen to the last episode because Brian dropped some serious knowledge about how you should think about BD. But Back to the point. So any last thoughts on that sort of the whole brain thinking is your specific thing before we move on to the thematic thing? Well, we can jump to the thematic part of it, Mo, because I think that's really, really important too. I mean, what I took away from this, what I took away from the snowball system in its entirety is maybe two things, consistency and habit. Mm. And, you know, I, I think success in business development very often is just about forming really good habits. Just form really good habits. Consistency is key to forming those really good habits, but form really good habits. Do it early and persist. And I, that's why I just feel, you know, you, you, you referenced past, uh, past webinars or past podcasts. I want to, invite you to reference another one and that's James Clear. I feel yeah. like you and James Clear are just an incredibly dynamic duo. His concepts around habits and the way that you apply building habits from a business development perspective, I think are, is just immensely helpful. Well, thank you. And everybody, what, what Brian's referring to is that it's like episode five, six, seven, something like that out of these hundreds that we've got now, but it's me and James mashing up snowball system and atomic habits. And, um, Boy, does he just, he, 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 he applies, I thought through the top three issues I see seller experts have type issues that they could solve through habits and then ask him, how would you approach these? And man, he just laid down exactly what he would do. And it was like you said, Brian, it was, it was brilliant. Um, so let me, let me go back to this because you, just as you talked about consistency, consistency and habit, 
I remember you saying something again, 20, 25 years ago. And when you said it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. We were just like in an airport walking to a plane or something. You go, yeah, um, I'm going to follow up, you know, with the, with the client we were at later tonight. Um, because one of the things I do every night is I just clean out my inbox and make sure I've answered every single email. And you just sort of like casually mention that as we're walking down and I'm like, whoa, 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 you answer every email every night. And you're like, yeah, I always know I'm going to have emails. So I block off time and I know I'm going to, I may not answer every single person with the full answer, but I'll at least let them know I got it. And then I tend to follow up, you know, next Tuesday or whatever. And like, that's just one little example of a habit, Brian, but I'm interested that you had that influenced me long ago. Um, and I'm interested, like what, for you personally, what are your, what's your consistency? What are your habits when you think about maybe daily, weekly, whatever else, what are the key things for you personally? Do you try to, to keep top of mind and do consistently over time? Well, um, Mo, since you mentioned that one, so first off, I want to say we're talking about uh, like ancient history when email was new. So I didn't have that many. So, but anyway. There was only three a day. So it was easy. Yeah. It was still hard. I wasn't doing but it. At, so. but, at, but to that point, what, what, what I would like to say is, you know, that, that that was a habit that was taught to me. It was taught to me from a different context. You might yep. remember a gentleman by the name of Dick Hudson, I, who, yep. Uh, yep. who I am channeling throughout these uh, interviews. And, you know, he would say, there's no phone, there is no reason that any phone call shouldn't go unreturned for 20 in for more than 24 hours. And he just drilled that into us for lots of different reasons. And we moved on to that. But, you know, I think, you know, one habit, Mo, that, that I, that, that I, I, I work hard on, I'm not saying I'm great at it, but I, you know, I try to hit the hundred percent, not the 99%, but I'm not sure I hit the hundred percent all the time. Is is that I, I feel like every week, and if not every week, every month, I should be able to find something of value to the clients that I hold most dear. And you know that does mean that I feel like I've got to block off time to do the right research, the right scanning, to find something that is of value, mostly professionally, but sometimes personally is just as good Right, right. to um, those clients that I hold most dear. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a pest, but I don't want to stop thinking about them. And so driving, driving that sort of habit keeps me thinking about them top of mind and sometimes helps me think help sort of spur a thought about a new or a different avenue that I should pursue, question, ask about, or maybe a new or different avenue that I may be able to help them. So I think yeah. that's kind of an important one for me. Oh, I, I think it's huge. And it's funny because um, maybe I got that through you. I have no idea. But at, readers of the Snowball System, our Grow Big training would recognize it. We, you know, we have a list we call the protomoy list. It's a Greek word. It means first among equals. But A, what was implied in what you said in the habit is A, you know who the clients are that you hold most dear. We call that a protomoy list. Usually five or 10 people is plenty. You don't need 162 people on this. Um, but, but then secondly, blocking off the time. I mean, what would you say? How much time do you block off a month to do that? I, I have a number in mind, but I'm curious about what yours is. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I haven't really thought about it, added up, but there is a half an hour in the morning that there are certain things that I scan, and then there's a Saturday morning ritual that I have around that. So, yep. um, so, so if I were to say, you know, uh, maybe two and a half hours on the weekday and an hour on Saturday, so three and a half hours a week at least. Yeah. No. And that's outbound proactive. I was just thinking about you and here's the thing and it's personalized, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. Powerful. So if that, so to the audience, um, if that sounds like a lot, think big, you're going to be Brian over time, but start small and scale up. Just choose a block an hour a month off, you know, the, the first Monday of a month, block off an hour and just do it for one person, two people, something like that. 
build that habit, get that feedback of how great it feels to have somebody reply back, build up from there, and then you can be Brian over time. Think big, start small, scale up. That's awesome, Brian. Well, well, any what what other what wrap would you give on this whole episode? Like uh, just something for somebody of all the stuff we talked about in this episode. What what thing would you say? Hey, folks, if you want to get better at business development, keep this in mind. What's the this? You know, uh, I, I'm going to go back to two, Mo. Uh, so if that's okay, the whole brain thinking: think like your buyer, mm. think with your buyer's brain. Uh, so that's first and foremost. And then second, make it habitual. Um, create, think with your buyer's brain, but don't do that just every once in a while. Make it habitual so it's almost constant that that's the way that you're entering into every conversation. I love it. Brian, fantastic. People are going to want to connect with you. Where should they go? Uh, Brian.Caffarelli at stsconsulting.com or, or just on LinkedIn. It's great. Fantastic. We'll put those in the show notes, everybody. Hey, if you didn't catch them, make sure you catch those uh, prior two episodes we taped. We record. I know we, we referred back to those. There's some really great stuff in those. And make sure you subscribe, follow, turn on your notifications, all that stuff, because we got two more to come. Brian, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Mo. Hey, everybody. Mo Bunnell here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Of all the guests in season three and of all the episodes, because we use these consistent questions at the top of each episode, five for each guest, of all the guests and of all the episodes, this is the one I've looked forward to the most. So Brian, I'm, I'm throwing it down. Sorry for all the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> But I've got I've got Brian Caffarelli. I'm not gonna no, raise I'm not gonna raise my arms up because you'll see the stains underneath. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's cold outside in Chicago, so it'll keep keep the temperature down. <laughs> so, um, of, uh, but I'm serious. Um, this is such a cool question set. In this episode, always for all the guests, starts out sort of broad, and you just get deeper and deeper and more meaningful as you go. And I and I suspect we'll have that same thing here. And, and the, the reason, audience, that I'm so interested in this one is Brian have a, and I have a 20-plus year relationship. He's one of the people I look up to the most at being great at growth. So here's the question, Brian. Tell me, uh, tell me of a business development story that you're really, really proud of. Um, okay. So I'll tell you a story. And what I'm proud of, Mo, is not the outcome, but the lesson that I learned. So that's... That's the story. Um, I like so it. This, that creates a lot of curiosity yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. So this is going to go way back. So this goes way, way back into early in my Hewitt career. And um, this is about a sales effort that I was part of. And so if we go way, way back and uh, way, way back, there was um, an organization we were trying to sell to. They were probably Fortune 20 and they were uh, amongst the most recognized and powerful brands in their industry, actually in the world. And um, they were highly recognized for their employer brand and their um, innovations in human resources. So that was the potential prospect. And they were thinking about actually outsourcing all of their benefit administration activity. Now, that's pretty common today, but at the time, that was really rare. It was uh, very difficult for organizations to make that decision. Most organizations had invested into internal solutions, but this organization began to think that they might want to outsource all of their benefit administration work. That was a business that Hewitt was into, but we were small and we weren't easy to hire for that service at that point in time. And so that's how the sale began. And one thing led to another, and we were quite fortunate. Ultimately, that prospect said, you're the organization that we'd like to work with. We'd like to hire you. We'd like you to provide this service for us. You're the organization we want to do this with. And so that moved us into contract negotiations. And for the most part, those went really, really well. Statement of work, great. Fees, great. Deliverable, great. Timing, great. Performance metrics, great. Penalties, great. All of that was great. But then we came to one particular contract provision. And for this client, 
they were of a stature that they could drive all of their vendors to accept this particular contract provision. That was A. And B, because this decision in and of itself was so risky, new, and important to them, it was really critical that we accept that contract provision. We couldn't accept it. So they needed us to accept that contract provision. We couldn't accept it. We worked as hard as we could to come up with some common ground there, but we just couldn't get there. So, um, you know, I was just a pup. I was just a kid, but uh, I had the opportunity to go in front of our executive committee, which at that point in time was our akin to our board of directors and present an argument as to why we should modify our position and ultimately come to agreement on this. And so, Mo, that was one of those 30 minute meetings that was done in 30 seconds. And so uh, the answer was no, we're not doing it. That's that. And so um, depending upon your perspective, we either had to walk away from the deal or we were dismissed. But either way, the organization went in a different direction and we didn't get that. And uh, so that was sad. Um, but the you know, what I learned from that is uh, the chairman of our executive committee said to me, uh, you know what, anybody can make a sale. What we rely on you to do is to make a quality sale. You're the one who guards the door. You guard the door. The people that you let in, the organizations that you let in, the deals that you let in have to be outstanding for our associates. They have to put us in a position to create a great experience for the client and they have to be fantastic for the client. You have to solve the equation in three variables you guard the door and you don't let anybody in or that's not going to be the case. And then he said to me, which I didn't really understand at the time, but I came to understand later is we will never regret the client that we lost more than we will regret the wrong client that we won. And that doesn't absolve you from the responsibility of making sales for the organization, but it means that you'd have to make the right sale every time. And so that was a hard lesson, but uh, that was the that was the lesson I learned, and that was a lesson that stuck with me for a long, long time. To this day, I can even remember him saying it in the way he said it to this day. Wow. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I can even, as a side note, I know we can both think of clients that we fired ourselves from because those clients weren't the right fit for our associates, didn't treat our people well, and it, you know... The, the implications of that were just so big around our culture and it had much more impact than any revenue or one client. You um, know, and Mo, hold on to that comment for a second. You said that we fired ourselves from that client. You know, the, the, the tough thing is we let them in the door first. Ooh. And we let them in the door first and we let those bad things happen because we let them in the door first. Bad things for our associates. And guess what? How does it feel to be the person that's whose name is on the sale that's creating this bad environment for our associates. Awful for the client. It's terrible yeah. for the client. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that we got to that situation. And, you know, I think the seller bears primary responsibility in those. I mean, I've always felt like the seller bears primary responsibility for those situations. Yeah. Oh, it makes all the sense in the world. So let's go deeper. So to play back that quote that the, the effective chairman said to you, we never will regret. Tell me the rest of that. Yeah, we'll never regret the we'll never regret the client we didn't get as much as the wrong client that we did. Yeah. So then now I want to get to sort of you personally. So the story was interesting. The lesson I feel like was the the nut of the lesson or the real nugget was close to what that, that last statement you yeah. made. What makes you so proud then about maybe not just the, that deal that you had to unwind and, and they went in a different direction, but what makes you so proud around this lesson, this idea? Yeah, I think, Mo, in that situation, that means that, you know, we sort of had to step up and I think step up from two dimensions. You know, as a seller, you have to step up from two, or I felt, uh, I had to step up from two dimensions. One is, I think you know, there's different ways to describe the vocabulary, but I think what a buyer does is they buy, they purchase, they use, and they embrace. And, you know, as a seller, I think 
Now it is my responsibility to make sure I'm with the buyer through all of those steps, buy, purchase, use, and embrace. So that's number one. Number two is, you know, you always run the risk of the seller doer divide, but the buyer user divide. Ooh. And, you know, I think it's important as a seller that you make sure there is no seller doer divide, but that you also don't just leave it to the buyer. You have to make sure there's no buyer user divide. And I think if you're committed to all four stages, buy, purchase, use, embrace, and if you're committed to making sure that you, you know, create the bridge such that there's no seller doer divide nor buyer user divide, then I think we can be in a good place where we brought the right people through the door and it's a great, great outcome for all parties involved. Yeah, I love that. Um, there's so, so the final follow up question with a bit of a story before it. I remember very specifically, in fact, wrote a little bit about this in the snowball system about a particular client where the client itself had been awesome for us back in the day. I mean, just great. But a new person had brought, been brought in to be head of like comp and benefits, which, which at the time, a lot of our consulting services went through head of comp and ban and, and, and CHRO, depending on the titles that, that people had in the scale of the organization. And in this particular case, while the client had been amazing to work with for years, this one new person got slotted in and was just awful. Like awful to me personally, back in the day, it was a, I was just doing, uh, I was doing healthcare actuarial work and, and my boss, a guy named Craig Dolezal at the time who ran the healthcare practice, you know, Craig really well. Um, he said that this just isn't acceptable and called up and fired ourselves from this entirety of the organization, even though not all of it, things went through this one person and uh, oh my gosh, what a risk for us to take. Cause we were really just still getting our legs underneath us from a healthcare consulting standpoint. And he was willing to do that to, 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 to save the culture, to save yeah. this group, to save Hewitt. And uh, oh my gosh, was that meaningful to me, obviously, but, but it was a um, almost something that, that, that send a message to our entire organization, obviously to theirs, that person within a few months, that feedback rippled around their organization they uncovered all kinds of other things because this person was being mean to us and obviously all of their staff and they let that person go. It might have even only been a few weeks later. Wow. And then they came back and hired us for even more work because we had the guts to do that. Now, that's not the reason you do it, but but boy, what a powerful message it says when you do unwind something that that wasn't a good fit. So, gosh, this is this cultural stuff is so powerful. What's your biggest from from your whole story, from everything we've talked about in this episode? What what would you communicate to the audience around what they need to be doing, the power of this idea? Just what's your what are your closing thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think this one all revolves around shared expectations, like shared expectations and drive those down to what they really, really, really mean. You know, sometimes we can give lip service to shared expectations and then you don't want to say, but I don't want to talk about this because that could blow the deal. Well, you know. We got to talk about those things up front right away. Yep. So the concept of really being diligent and disciplined around creating shared expectations between every party that's going to be working together once the sale is complete, I think is really, really important because once the sale is complete, oh my gosh, what a terrible thing we have to do to either... A, fire a client. I mean, that's just awful. Or B, allow our people to suffer through a terrible client relationship, which is even worse. So I think dealing with it up front is really, really key. No matter how um, vulnerable we might be in uh, delineating and inventorying those shared expectations. Yeah, I like that. You're exactly right. But if something isn't a fit, gosh, better to find that earlier rather than later. And and if we tie back, I'll just put a bow on this, Brian, and we'll close out. But just to tie back to our last episode, everybody go back and check that out, where we talked about whole brain thinking. It feels like there's four big areas of shared expectations. One is, do we even have strategic fit culturally on this particular statement of work or project, this effort? Does the timing fit? It, you know, are the way, are, is the timing of what we can do and what you need as a client, is that a fit? 
That's the second thing. The third is there a is is there is a human being fit? Do we enjoy working together? Are we going to treat each other? Are we going to be better off together than we are apart? Is it going to be fun? Then the fourth fit is around money and terms and service level agreements and metrics and all that kind of stuff. Is there a fit there? And if you've got a yes in all those, the strategic fit, the timing, the culture of the team and, and, the, and the terms, if you will, man, then you've got something really strong. Um, so cool. Well, Brian, people are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to want to say thank you. You've given some real sage, wise advice on this episode. Where should they go? Uh, Brian, dot caffarelli at stsconsulting.com or there's a lot of letters there linkedin is probably easiest so uh that's a great place too awesome and we'll we'll put those in the show notes so you just one click away everybody brian this has been fantastic love the depth of this thanks for being on the show thanks mo hey everybody mo bundle your host here at real relationships real revenue Man, I've had so much fun with Brian Caffarelli. Brian, we've, we've recorded four videos. All of them have been fantastic. This last one, I think, is going to be a lot of fun. Everybody, I've, I've known Brian for over a couple decades, and he's one of the people that I look up to the most when it comes to be somebody who's great at growth. So, Brian, with that, well, obviously, with that, putting you up on a pedestal up at the top, I'm so curious if you could record a video about something around business development, growth skills, what to think about, and send it back to your prior self, your younger Brian Caffarelli. What would that video say? You know, uh, well, I was thinking about this, and you know, so, so I'm going back to the younger Brian Caffarelli, and there were so many times when I was thinking, like, man, selling is hard. This is hard. This is difficult. Uh, this this client, I can't figure this out. This is really hard. This is difficult. And what, if I could, what I wish I would have said to that guy earlier is, you know, if you think selling is hard, it's probably because buying is harder. And that's what I wish I would have known. And I, and I really do believe that. Whenever selling is hard, it's because buying is harder. And had I known that, I feel like I would have been more empathetic and more in tune and more in touch with the challenges that our buyers and that whole buying center, buying constituency had as it related to making, you know, really gut-wrenching, highly personal, multi-million dollar decisions that will not just impact the company, but every employee or retiree in the company for years. Like, that's hard. The selling part's easy. That decision is what's really hard. And I think if I would have been more in tune and more empathetic to the challenges of the buyer, I would have been better in the role that I was in. Yeah. So this idea of flipping things from selling to, to not selling more, but creating better buying experiences, um, making it easier to buy, being a guide, as you've talked about a couple episodes ago, everybody go back and check out the prior episodes you did with Brian. The, the second one in the series of five, just so great talking about a guide uh, to help somebody on their buying journey, things like that. So, Brian, I guess you're saying from flipping from, from the selling mindset to the creating a wonderful buying experience mindset is, is the main message you'd give back? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, whenever, whenever I feel stuck, I bet the buyer is even more stuck. So let's, yeah. that's not like... You know, like when people, when sometimes when you, you know, you speak Spanish and I speak English, the way I get across to you is just speak English louder. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's, let's not do that. Let's just, let's just better understand what's going on on the buying side of the equation. I'm sorry, but that's maybe one of the funniest things I've ever heard you say, because it's so true. So, so the metaphor is um, you, when something's stuck, we just start yelling selling language louder as opposed yeah. to try to speak span try to speak the other language the yeah. buy language if yeah. you will okay so that is that's so funny sorry um <laughs> i just need a chance to laugh for a second okay so now when you're thinking from creating that great buying experience from the mind of brian caffarelli from your perspective what are the top couple things someone needs to to do and think about to create that great buy experience you know, one thing I'd start with is sort of to 
deconstruct the number of different decisions that need to be made. You know, whatever the sale is, it's never, I don't think it's ever just one decision. I'm right. buying this for this one. You know, there's many, many, many decisions that go into ultimately making a purchase. And I think sometimes, whether we try to do it empathetically or we're fortunate enough to have the dialogue, have the relationship where we can have an open dialogue around this, yep. to deconstruct each and every one of the decisions that need to be made before the final decision. And so that's number one. And then number two, once we've deconstructed those decisions, just sort of inventory where we are in that decision process. And, you know, there's a probably sequence. Um, some decisions can be made simultaneously, some sequentially, you know, some depend on others. So deconstruct those decisions and then get a sense of, and then get a sense of who kind of collectively has the decision rights for each of those decisions, I mean, just to get that out there. And then, you know, for sure, understand the personal motivations involved, not in the final big decision, but in each one of those little decisions. And I think sometimes, I can be wrong on this, but I think sometimes just going through that exercise is really helpful for the buyer. Like they don't often just have the space and the time to do all that. And just helping them do that sort of helps them make a better, you know, just, just prompting that helps them inventory the decisions they may, need to make and helps them make better decisions. So that, that's maybe the way that I'd think about it. Well, I love it. And for the audience, there's a, there's a tool in the snowball system called the opportunity list and they're broad buckets, um, but they're generally trying to deconstruct where somebody's at in a purchasing decision. It's written from their sort of from the behavioral science of their perspective. And the most important thing, and Brian, I've seen you do, the, do this really well. I want you to comment on it is it's always the, the, the seller expert, the guide, if you will, in your metaphor from a couple episodes with, ago, it's the guide's job to, to help the person understand what the next step is and guide them to the right thing for them, right? So how do you think about asking for that next step, um, or maybe even before that, figuring out what the next step is, having a dialogue with, with the buyer, asking for that or suggesting what the next step might be? Like, how do you keep all, all you're really good at being proactive and always like being a step ahead and helping the the buying process in the right ways? How do you do that? Well, so Mo, first off, go to your checklist because there's uh, there's a map in there. So let's yep. just start with, if you want to keep going with it, if you want to keep going with the guide metaphor, yep. there's a map. The checklist is a map. Go to your yep. checklist. It's a map. It's a map for the guide. So let's just start there. So that's A. But then, you know, B is, I think there, are, uh, I think history can be, yeah. sorry, history can be a guide too. So like, when has your organization bought something like this before? And not bought this service, not bought this service, but bought a service like this, maybe a service that impacts all employees or a service that requires a contractual agreement or a service that requires the integration of these three parties within your organization, these three divisions. When has your organization bought something like this before and how did they do it? And can we learn lessons from history that'll take us further? And so that's the organizational side. But then I think the personal side is interesting too. When have you, maybe in a different, maybe at a different point in your career or at a different organization, or you know, uh, when have you bought something like this before? How did it work? What did you learn? What's different here? So I think sometimes walking people backwards into history, they might see interesting challenges that they've overcome in the past and lessons that they learned that now, once they begin to embrace them, they can apply them to the present that where, where we might be a little challenged. I think that's amazing. And <clears throat> I swallowed wrong, Brian, we're keeping this live because we always keep things live, but my voice might get hoarse if you're listening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> one thing I think is really neat about that is I'll, I'll tie back to the to the snowball system for a second and then I want to point out something I've seen you do. I think it was probably like in 2001 or something, but I want your comments on it. If we think of that decoding, 
we've written this from our perspective because that's we're the one that's going to act, but there's a flip side to it. So listen and learn, create curiosity, build everything together, gain approval. What the client can experience is they can listen and learn our side. They feel heard. We get it, right? Create curiosity. They feel curious about how we might be able to solve their problems because they, they, they feel like we understand them and we might have some expertise. Build everything together from their side. They get to co-create and sort of shape things, massage it, make sure it fits. From our side, gain approval. From their side, excitement, you know, to, to get started. And those are real. I just want to give a real practical way that somebody could think think about this as they go on. OK, so back to the back to the story that I something I saw you do. I just thought this was brilliant. You and I were working with a very large organization, probably Fortune 20, Fortune 30, I think about the, at the time, a couple hundred thousand employees. And we visited their, their head of HR, and we were talking about potentially outsourcing all of their shared services and administrative functions to us, to Hewitt Associates. So maybe it's 2001 or something, I don't know. And we're having this really in-depth conversation, and I'm seeing you do these things. We didn't have these words for them before, but I'm seeing you clearly, because you were the expert in that space, I'm seeing you work with the head of HR around you know, trying to figure out what the next step in the buying journey is, how can you guide them, and, and so on. And at one point in the middle of this meeting, you say, you know what, if it would be helpful, I, I'd just be happy to show you our schematics on every single design element of how we build these out and how we deliver them. And you go, I'm not even sure if I can do that, but I'm just going to do it because it would be helpful to you. And I was there. And I just thought, oh my gosh, that is the most amazing gift of all time. And we chatted about it on the way back to the airport. And he said, gosh, not only is that going to be helpful to them, that's the next step they need to do is to actually see what this looks like. But they're probably going to realize that this is sort of a harder thing than anybody thinks. So if I, and I'm trying to give this story as just a really practical example of how you might, how our audience might think about what the next thing is in a buying journey. And a lot of times in the early stages, it is giving your big brain or your processes away. So just your thoughts on the sort of early stage, how to create demand and momentum in a, in a buying journey. Yeah, I, 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 you, you know, if we, that early stage, how to create demand or, or momentum in a buyer journey, you know, I think sometimes, sometimes what's important in that early stage is to focus on the, focus on the problem or bring light or uh, vision to a problem in the way that the buyer doesn't have. And, and, and Mo, I'm sure in that situation, probably what you and I were thinking is the buyer doesn't realize the enormity or the complexity Yes. the problem that they're dealing with. And so without realizing the enormity or complexity of the problem that they're dealing with, the problem seems smaller. And so our solution maybe seem outsized. And so I think in that situation, what we're trying to do is sort of just focus on this problem could be bigger and more difficult than you realize. And the implications of not solving it might be fairly significant. And the implications of trying to solve it and failing are even more significant than that. And so, you know, that's one of those ones where um, you will have a better way to you will have a better way to say this, Mo. But that's one of those ones where sometimes I think sometimes I think sellers can potentially over-index on product knowledge and under-index on problem knowledge. Mm -hmm. And really, early on, when we're trying to when we're really trying to be helpful, but, and try to create demand, it's problem knowledge, not product knowledge, that I think is really the key there. Well, I love that. And um, one of the, one of my different friends said, uh, fall in love with the problem, not your solution. Yeah. You know, and I oh. think that's really aligned with what you said. Well, and what happened in that scenario for the audience is that we got on a call a couple weeks later and talked to talk the whole thing through. And I can't remember what ended up happening in the end, but I felt like, I realized at that moment working with you that we're, people are usually hired for one of two reasons. They're hired because either they could do the thing, but they don't have the time, or they've got the time, but they don't have the expertise, or both. And the realization that occurred from, from that, from that the, 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 what you offered 
by showing them literally like this is how we build this thing out and how many hundreds of people it takes and all the technology we use and all like they were if I remember right, they were even like big pieces of paper, like poster size that you had to see to map it out. And uh, the the realization that the the very senior person on the other side has like, whoa, this is this is a lot. This is a lot more than I thought it would be And there. That person is probably thinking in that moment, we don't have the time or the expertise. Thus, let's keep talking to you. And I just thought that 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 giving, you know, we call it a give to get, obviously, in the snowball system and growing mm-hmm. training. But that idea of giving away in the beginning is so powerful because it flips from talking about what you do to showing what you do and they get the experience of it. That's what you did in that moment. And here we are 20 years later. I still remember it just like it was yesterday. So anyway, how Brian, how would you wrap up this whole video to yourself? You know, to, to think about things from the buyer side as opposed to the seller. Your last comments for the audience about putting this into practice. Yeah, I, I, I really. So, Mo, there's probably probably empathy, I would imagine, is is sort of the key word here. And I think it's empathy for the buyer. And, you know, you and I have used the word buyer back and forth here, but I think in what what many of your clients sell, there is no such thing as a buyer. There right. are multiple people working together, sometimes in a very coordinated way, sometimes in a less than coordinated way that are trying to make really hard decisions. And it's the ability to be empathetic, not just with your content, you know, not just with the person you have a great relationship with, but I think empathetic with everybody who has everybody who plays a role in that buying decision as much as possible. And once we're appropriately empathetic, then I think we can better understand the buying challenges. And then maybe, maybe we can come up with the right solution to those challenges. I love it. Mic drop. Uh, Nothing more to add. It's the Brian, it's the perfect ending, not just to this episode, but to all five. I, I just feel compelled to tell everybody, go back and if you haven't already, watch or listen to all the five of these episodes. Brian's one of the people that I look up to as being not just one of the best business developers I've ever met or worked with, but Brian, very sincerely, one of the best human beings and value creators in the universe that I've ever met or worked with. And I just could, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. You mean a lot to me. You're just one of the most special people I've ever met. Thank you so much. Mo, thank you very much. And may I ask a favor before we wrap? Would you be okay with me just asking a quick favor? Ask uh, if you'd indulge me one more comment before we wrap. You've said a lot of highly complimentary things about uh, the the wisdom you and I have shared over the course of of these um, five episodes. But, you know, I want to be clear what I shared, it's not original thought, and it it came from three people specifically. And if you're okay with this, I'd just like to name them. Do it. You know, in, in one episode, we talked about the concept of guarding the door. And uh, that was from Jerry Wilson, who was the chairman of our executive committee at Hewitt Associates. And in another episode, you know, we talked about focus on helping the buyer make an informed and confident journey, uh, make an informed and confident decision in their journey. The only way that you can really focus on that is you have, if you have tremendous confidence in the product line that you're representing and the firm that you're representing. And for me, I was fortunate enough to represent a service that was built by, built and run and led by a gentleman named Tom Schmitz. And that's why I had the confidence to act the way that I did. And then, mm-hmm. then lastly, um, you know, at Hewitt Associates, everything about our sales culture emanated from a gentleman by the name of Dick Hudson, who un- unfortunately passed away this January. And um, he's the one who built the, cult- the sales culture that was focused on sincerity, empathy, professionalism, and discipline. And... Um, while he's no longer with us, um, I think his legacy lives on in the values and the principles that he infused in the thousands of people that he touched in his career. And so thank you for letting me mention their their names. That That's very meaningful for me, and I, I wanted to get their names out. So thanks, Mo. Thank you. And meaningful for me, too. You know, those three people didn't just, and many others, but th- those three in particular didn't just impact the 
their direct reports or the the people in their group or whatever you know i think of all three personally me for me dick those people flew around the country and taught people they they didn't just run a pnl they they ran a a, a culture of um helping people thrive and become who they could become and they always did things like you they always did things to to benefit others they were always a net giver they were always a net contributor and even if that meant them taking a, a late flight out to get home or whatever they always found a way to impact others and i thought that was a the Hewitt Associates culture was just absolutely amazing and it was one in which people thrived largely because of people like Jerry, Tom, and Dick. So I'm really glad you brought it up. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for being on the show. This has been Thanks, amazing. Brian. I had high expectations. You've uh, all the way. A pleasure. I was honored to be invited. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.